Hi, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel. Very happy to, to, uh, to be with Maria Carrillo, who's the Chief Scientific Officer for the Alzheimer's Association. Maria, thank you for being with us. Um, it would be really fun to hear about your job, what you do, uh, how you uh, trained, how you came to have your job, and, and then more importantly, talk to us about Alzheimer's disease. Talk to us about the oncoming epidemic of Alzheimer's disease, if you will. Sure. Well, I'm, you know, I'm a neuroscientist by training. And I'm a bench scientist uh, working at Northwestern University during my PhD um, and actually looking at learning and memory. And one of the best systems uh, to study learning and memory is actually looking at brains where learning and memory kind of goes awry, goes wrong. And so my job in the lab, and it was uh, uh, John Disterhoff's lab, uh, looking at uh, conditioning, mm -hmm. classic examples of learning in animals, uh, was to actually translate that and try to create a human model. And so that's what I did in the lab. Uh, and after that, I actually continued to work in humans at Rush University in Chicago for seven years, where I did a postdoctoral fellowship um, and was an assistant professor, sort of early faculty, young faculty uh, there before I joined the Alzheimer's Association. So I have some bench work as well as uh, some experience with clinical work um, in working with the religious order study at Rush uh, and doing imaging at Rush. So I think for what that has helped for me to do at the Alzheimer's Association, now that I've been there for 12 years and um, in charge of the science program, which is a program that is representative of the breadth of science in Alzheimer's, uh, is that I can bring to the table some understanding about what the basic science world looks like, what it needs, the continuing need for the empirical knowledge of understanding, not only about the brain, how it ages, but also then how it ages with pathology. Uh, but then also how we might be able to observe those things, not only with imaging, but with you know, behavioral and cognitive testing in the human population. Because ultimately, everything we want to do in animals is really just to try to create systems that model human behavior so that we can stop a hopefully tractable disease. Yeah, great. And I just want to thank you for your leadership at the Alzheimer's Association. You've really injected a great deal of energy into the scientific programs and also substantially increased the breadth of work that's being done. And again, it's about the patient. It's about not having people get Alzheimer's disease. Let's talk a little bit about this, uh, this impending wave of cases of Alzheimer's disease. I think over the past few years, there have been several studies that have found um, perhaps lower prevalence of Alzheimer's disease or, or of all-cause dementia. And that's um, you know, an interesting finding and actually very important to share with the scientific community and the public at large. But many times it has been taken to mean uh, that Alzheimer's disease is no longer a problem, that dementia is no longer a problem, because it's actually it's decreasing um, due to higher education, due to higher income brackets, due to better cardiovascular control, which is, of course, cardiovascular risk factors are huge risk factors for Alzheimer's and related dementias. Um, and actually what I was trying to uh, demonstrate is that that is not the case. The numbers actually point us to the fact that baby boomers who are right now actually 70 years old and below, and will continue over the next 15 years to turn 65 plus, are a bolus of population that is really going to cause Alzheimer's disease to hit an all-time high, right. ever. Right. And so we need to be cognizant of that. And even though public health messaging around cardiovascular health is important, around increased education, keeping yourself physically active is critical. And we must do that because it's, a, it's our responsibility as a field to communicate that positive news, we also have to continue to find a cure. And whether that means combination therapies that include lifestyle, like heart disease did, like cancer does, or therapeutics in other ways, we must continue to pursue all of that. You know, I, th I think about the numbers. Uh, realistically, there's about 5.2 million Americans mm -hmm. with Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> and I never think about that number. And alone, I think about, well, it takes about two people to care for everybody with Alzheimer's. So really, in this country right now, there are probably 15 to 16 million people employed in either suffering the disease or caring for someone who has the disease. That's a large fraction of our population. And what you're, the, the point you're making, it's only going to get greater. Absolutely. And our, estimation, our estimations actually are that there are 15 million caregivers for over five million Americans, and certainly does not include the costs of unpaid care, which is huge. I mean, I have examples in my own family where I have a mother-in-law with Alzheimer's disease in the severe stages, and my father-in-law, unfortunately, has vascular dementia as well. 
and they're both being cared for in the home and we're paying for it out of our pocket. What is this going to do to our economy if we don't do something about Alzheimer's disease? You know, I think one of the things that we do know is that the $230 billion it costs us today to care for over 5 million Americans with Alzheimer's is only going to reach $1.1 trillion by mid-century if we cannot change the trajectory of this disease. And we can't afford that. What we would love, though, to be able to say is, you know, we talk about expensive treatments, and certainly when we talk about, hear about results of clinical trials, and we know we, we, we wonder and, and are, get suspicious about the costs of future treatments, how expensive they might be, it would be great to have that conversation, to have mm. a successful treatment, even though expensive, it would be great to have that problem. Because right now, it's the most expensive disease in America, and really in the world, but for the cost of care, not yes. treating. And that is an equation that must be turned around. So I can imagine if you're going to do the calculus, the bookkeeping on that, cost of care is the 230 billion. <clears throat> but imagine that an effective treatment might not only reduce that substantially, mm -hmm. but put put these people back to work, or at the very least, have them available for their families. The the sort of the emotional and social. Uh, sort of, if you will, a return on investment right. for finding a treatment. Mm -hmm. and that's a really important part of, I think, our mission as a patient advocacy group, is to remind people that, you know, the symbol is people and science. It's a head and a beaker, right? Mm -hmm. It's about patient-focused research, because we must care for people that are suffering today, like my family, but we also must care enough to want to find a cure. When we think about finding this cure, it, 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 it takes a it takes a whole community of scholars and, and folks who study at the bench like you did, clinicians. It takes uh, epidemiologists. It takes uh, biomarker developers. It takes clinical trialists. Um, it takes a whole community of scholars to do that. Um, that's a major enterprise, and the Alzheimer's Association has supported that. But it hasn't done it alone. It's done it with partners, including industry, including the NIH. Talk a little bit about public-private partnerships yeah. and where do you think that fits in the whole equation? You know, I think uh, the advent of public-private partnerships, which really began about 10 years ago with sort of the ADNI study, Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, um, has changed and revolutionized the way we think about things in multiple ways. First of all, I think our community at large comes together from all of those different vantage points, those different stakeholders, so to speak, mm -hmm. right, that include patient advocacy groups, not just us, but others, uh, and also the NIH, which has a significant amount of not only influence, but dollars as well that they bring to the table, and industry, because we can't leave industry behind, right? We can't leave industry out. They put a substantial amount of investment in this, and we absolutely have to have them at the table. But additionally, more recently, the FDA has gotten incredibly involved and interested in Alzheimer's disease, and a lot of that has to do with the national plan to address Alzheimer's, right? It's attempt to create a unification of all of the agencies, the federal and private agencies that are working towards Alzheimer's disease, and that's helped a lot. These public-private partnerships have allowed us to do the following. Not only do larger scale, scale trials, perhaps observational trials that wouldn't have been done otherwise, as large to a large extent and large scale, but also to add things to projects, large scale projects that wouldn't have gotten done otherwise. For example, uh, we've uh, participated with um, the uh, Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative, uh, the Generation Study that uh, Eric Ryman and Pierre Terrio are leading. And we've added uh, remote genetic counseling. Because if that study does work and a homozygote uh, for APOE4 um, is a population that is tractable for disease, we need to be doing genetic counseling in a more efficient way mm -hmm. than a one-hour consultation that can be very expensive. So we're testing out a remote telephonic uh, genetic counseling experience. So those types of things, I think, are important for us as a patient advocacy group to participate in because we know that there will be a need for that, and if we start that now, we won't be behind when a trial hopefully would be positive. So these are some of the types of things that I think public-private partnerships allow us to do. They also allow us to leverage dollars. Mm. We don't have all the dollars in the world as a patient advocacy group, neither does the NIH or the government. However, all together, we really pool dollars together to make them go further. Well, and I think pooling dollars and pooling minds and pooling spirits is what we really need right now. So, Marie, we thank you for your work for the Alzheimer's Association, and we're so pleased you came and met with us today. Thank you for your leadership, Bill. It's great to be here with you. Thanks. Bill Mobley for The Brain Channel.